The Economic Consequences of the Peace by John Maynard Keynes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Macmillan. The Economic Consequences of the Peace by John Maynard Keynes, 1920. Preface. The writer of this book was temporarily attached to the British Treasury during the war and was their official representative at the Paris Peace Conference up to June 7, 1919. He also sat as deputy for the Chancellor of the Exchequer on the Supreme Economic Council. He resigned from these positions when it became evident that hope could no longer be entertained of substantial modification in the draft terms of peace. The grounds of his objection to the treaty, or rather to the whole policy of the conference towards the economic problems of Europe, will appear in the following chapters. They are entirely of a public character, and are based on facts known to the whole world. J. M. Keynes, King's College, Cambridge, November, 1919. Chapter 1. Introductory. The power to become habituated to his surroundings is a marked characteristic of mankind. Very few of us realize with conviction the intensely unusual, unstable, complicated, unreliable, temporary nature of the economic organization by which Western Europe has lived for the last half century. We assume some of the most peculiar and temporary of our late advantages as natural, permanent, and to be depended on, and we lay our plans accordingly. On this sandy and false foundation we scheme for social improvement, and dress our political platforms, pursue our animosities and particular ambitions, and feel ourselves with enough margin in hand to foster, not a sage, civil conflict in the European family. Moved by insane delusion and reckless self-regard, the German people overturned the foundations on which we all lived and built. But the spokesmen of the French and British peoples have run the risk of completing the ruin which Germany began by a peace which, if it is carried into effect, must impair yet further when it might have restored the delicate, complicated organization, already shaken and broken by war, through which alone the European peoples can employ themselves and live. In England, the outward aspect of life does not yet teach us to feel or realize in the least that an age is over. We are busy picking up the threads of our life where we drop them, with this difference only, that many of us seem a good deal richer than we were before. Where we now spent millions before the war, we have now learnt that we can spend hundreds of millions, and apparently not suffer for it. Evidently, we did not exploit to the utmost the possibilities of our economic life. We look, therefore, not only to a return to the comforts of 1914, but to an immense broadening and intensification of them. All classes alike thus build their plans, the rich to spend more and save less, the poor to spend more and work less. But perhaps it is only in England and America that it is possible to be so unconscious. In continental Europe the earth heaves, and no one but is aware of the ramblings. There it is not just a matter of extravagance or labor troubles, but of life and death, of starvation and existence, and of the fearful convulsions of a dying civilization. For one who spent in Paris the greater part of the six months which succeeded the armistice, an occasional visit to London was a strange experience. England still stands outside Europe. Europe's voiceless tremors do not reach her. Europe is a part, and England is not of her flesh and body. But Europe is solid with herself. France, Germany, Italy, Austria, and Holland, Russia and Romania and Poland throb together, and their structure and civilization are essentially one. They flourish together. They have rocked together in a war, which we, in spite of our enormous contributions and sacrifices, like, though in a less degree than America, economically stood aside, and they may fall together. In this lies the destructive significance of the Peace of Paris. If the European Civil War is to end with France and Italy abusing their momentary victorious power to destroy Germany and Austria-Hungary, now prostrate, they invite their own destruction also, being so deeply and inextricably intertwined with their victims by hidden psychic and economic bonds. At any rate, an Englishman who took part in the Conference of Paris, and was during those months a member of the Supreme Economic Council of the Allied Powers, was bound to become, for him a new experience, a European in his cares and outlook. There at the nerve center of the European system, his British preoccupations must largely fall away, and he must be haunted by other and more dreadful specters. Paris was a nightmare, and everyone there was morbid. A sense of impending catastrophe overhung the frivolous scene, the futility and smallness of man before the great events confronting him, the mingled significance and unreality of the decisions. Levity, 
blindness, insolence, confused cries from without. All the elements of ancient tragedy were there. Seated indeed amid the theatrical trappings of the French saloons of state, one could wonder if the extraordinary visages of Wilson and of Clemenceau, with their fixed hue and unchanging characterization, were really faces at all, and not the tragicomic masks of some strange drama or puppet show. The proceedings of Paris all had this air of extraordinary importance and unimportance at the same time. The decisions seemed charged with consequences to the future of human society, yet the air whispered that the word was not flesh, that it was futile, insignificant and of no effect, disassociated from events, and one felt most strongly the impression, described by Tolstoy in War and Peace, or by Hardy in The Dentists, of events marching on to their fated conclusion, uninfluenced and unaffected, by the celebrations of statesmen and council. Spirit of the Years Observe that all wide sight and self-command deserts these throngs now driven to demonry. By the imminent unreckoning, naught remains but vindictiveness here amid the strong, and there amid the weak an impotent rage. Spirit of the Pities Why prompts the will so senseless shaped a doing? Spirit of the Years I have told thee that it works unwittingly, as one possessed not judging. In Paris, where those connected with the Supreme Economic Council received almost hourly the reports of the misery, disorder, and decaying organization of all Central and Eastern Europe, allied and enemy alike, and learned from the lips of the financial representatives of Germany and Austria unanswerable evidence of the terrible exhaustion of their countries, an occasional visit to the hot, dry room in the President's house, where the four fulfilled their destinies in emptiness and arid intrigue, only added to the sense of nightmare. Yet there in Paris the problems of Europe were terrible and clamant, and an occasional return to the vast unconcern of London a little disconcerting. For in London these questions were very far away, and her own lesser problems alone troubling. London believed that Paris was making a great confusion of its business, but remained uninterested. In this spirit the British people received the treaty without reading it. But it is under the influence of Paris, not London, that this book has been written, by one who, though an Englishman, feels himself a European also, and because of too vivid recent experience, cannot disinterest himself from the further unfolding of the great historic drama of those days, which will destroy great institutions, but may also create a new world. End of chapter 1. Introductory.